as you know, as you may have known, my background is in environmental and earth sciences. Let me go. So I'm coming up with this presentation from the side of using the environmental, using mathematics and environmental science. So um, in that particular industry or in that, in that particular field, the use of mathematics um, does not go to calculus. Um, there are occasions that we might need to, but not as far as astronomy, astronomy does. Um, so what I am interested in letting you know is how the math background contributes to something that is a lot more, I want to say, social. So it's, it's more of like a social experiment, so to speak. And I'm coming up with that from the topic of uh, the night sky. Um, we are coming down to the night. Usually, if this was the fall semester scenario, then uh, by now you will have a dark night sky and we can have this presentation outside and you can take a look at it. Um, but it's not night yet. Um, so uh, you just have to bear with me or bear with so-called app um, using. So um, I wanted to prelude with um, the fact that even though this is not considered mathematical science in the strictest sense, um, we are using data from uh, astronom astronomical observatories, for example, Mount Wilson, you might be fam familiar um, in terms of Caltech, um, and then Carnegie Science um, Observatory, and then there, there's the NOAA labs in um, Arizona, um, so, and then there's one in Chile, so these are the observatories whose data contributes into this presentation. Um, the first thing I wanted to point out is, um, if you look at the night light, um, which is what we see here. If I could pause this presentation for a second so it doesn't keep switching. Go ahead and... Oh. Is this doesn't seem like that's the feature I was looking for. Um, I'm just going to pause all of the. Oh, okay, thank you. Thank you. Great. Now I can concentrate. Thank you so much for bearing with me. Um, so, what we're seeing here are pictures of different parts of the world. Ah, now we see different parts of the world. Um, and as you can see from satellites, right, part of the ISS is seen over here uh, on the leftmost or the Yes, leftmost on your side. Um, so you can see that what night sky looks like from above, right? But have anyone looked at the world at night lately? Does it look like this? If you're, if you're hanging out on a street lamp, right? If you're, if you're waiting for someone, it doesn't really look like this, right? You don't have black dots mixed with bright spots. Uh, what you see is mostly white spots because our street lamps are meant to help, to help us see at night. And that's a great thing, right? We want to be able to see at night. We want to make sure that our streets are safe at night. But on the other hand, from a scientific point of view, we get into this problem called light pollution. So, um, and then from an environmental standpoint, light pollution basically is when you have the, uh, the light that is not appropriately used for its functional purposes. And what it does is it proliferates the, um, 
the different shades at night time that are deviation from natural. So what happens here is when you can see here, um, if you look at an example of one of these houses that you know are located on uh, a place that you can see an open night sky, uh, what you see here is lots of people, right, household, are now this versus what you're supposed to be seeing is the, the stars in the sky rather than being, uh, being filtered with different night. And one of the things that you can see here is the glares. And that's, to us, you know, we're used to it because it's, it's a metropolitan happening. But if you live in an area where, or if, you're, if you are one of the avid, you know, astronomer, avid, um, sky watcher, at night, you don't want to see that glare, right? You want to get as much of the night sky as possible, especially um, if you're an observatory. So when you see in the observatory, as you can see here, um, they're located as high as possible on grounds, right? Or in the middle of somewhere that, where there's no night light in order, to, um, in order to cover some of it. And how do we measure this idea of pollution? Because this is where the math comes in, right? So I know earlier I said, well, we don't need calculus, and we don't. <laughs> what you see here is, is a little bit of a physics background. Um, these, are, these are your intensity, your luminosity. Um, of the, and so lights are measured in certain units of intensity, but that really doesn't matter because when we use mathematics and we take ratios of the intensities, what we know is units Anybody? Sorry, coming from a high school background. So I usually pause for a reaction. When you have units set up in a ratio, what do they do? Simple math, simple math. If you have unit up on top, meters over meters, kilograms, they cancel, right? So what happens here is they cancel out, right? So what you add, end up with is a magnitude, a measurement of how polluted the light is, um, that actually comes in the form of dimensionalness, right? So the pollution scale is going to be one of those numbers that represent um, how much more something is polluted versus another just by simple measure of taking ratio between the intensities. Now, one of the things that you can see with the spectrum, um, besides that equation, you can see here, the apparent magnitude has a spectrum here. And we, what we can see here in our I limit is somewhere between 5 and 10. That's how far our, our eyes are able to see. But then you have certain magnitudes that the Hubble Space Telescopes can see even better, right? Um, and then the, the, different, uh, planets, uh, the different planets have different apparent magnitudes as well. But what is noted in this scenario is not looking at this number in, in terms of, oh, this is just a number line. If you look at this kind of equation here, right, the log or the logarithmic scale, anyone cares to elaborate how that might work? Some of you are in calculus, so maybe explain how this work might work a little bit more. Log is based on certain exponent, right? It's the opposite of exponent. So it's base 10, so it's 10 to the something, right? So what you're looking at is something with a magnitude, let's say, of 1 versus a magnitude of 6. You're not talking about just five times the pollution you're talking about 10 to the fifth pollution. And what's 10 to the fifth? 100,000 more times. So even though it's represented on a number scale, we shouldn't be full, right? The scale is logarithmic. It's made it so that you can see things, but when you look at the, even the graph paper, right? Your normal graph paper, is not put in a logarithmic scale. There's a certain graph paper, if you, you do your trigonometric math, 
right? Or your advanced algebra math, math, if you use the graph paper, you can see the graph paper, different stacks, right? It's some, some are closer, some are farther because of that logarithmic scale. So what you see here is this bunch together, right? They may seem like, oh yeah, not that much difference, right? But if you look at here to here, oh, maybe just a few space, but you're talking about order of millions, right? So Hubble Space Telescope can see things a million times, right? Better than what we can see. And then, and I, I feel like it's a little bit of my responsibility to uh, also squeeze in the James Webb Space Telescope because you might be familiar with that. Um, my second part of this presentation, if it were, it were an hour long, it would touch on the space, uh, James Webb Space Telescope, but I should mention, uh, have anyone seen some of the photographs that come out of that from space, especially Mars, right? So you can see that it's not only, so Hubble Space Telescope is already like on this side, right? If you're talking about James Webb, it's over here. So not only it's a million, it's another million, right, of a million. So you're talking about a 10 to the 12 scale of better images, right? Better visions. Um, so that's why this idea of light pollution is so important when you come to develop better technologies. When you develop telescopes that are better to see, right, far, far in a distant galaxy, far, far away, right? Um, I should save that for May 4th, not Pi Day. But um, if, you, if you develop such fantastic technology, the last thing you want to do is have pollution on Earth that covers up these technology that, that you cannot, that, that you would have used to see far away, right? So that's why even before we go out in the space, right, we look at uh, galaxies far away, we need to make sure that on Earth we're not polluting our vision. So here's another example. And now we're looking at a galaxy away, okay? So we're looking at star clusters. So on the left-hand side, you see it with the light pollution. On the right-hand side, you see it without light pollution. What are those dots? Any guess? Stars, essentially, right? Am I able to tell any stars here? Right? So that's what I mean. Like 10 to the sixth, right? So you got millions of stars here, and you've got pretty much none here, just based on the idea of the filtering of light pollution. For those of you who are into photography, so less on the mathematical side, right? More on the artsy side of science, you can see what the difference are between the pixels, right, of these photographs. And what you want here is this, right? You're trying to eliminate these. So what you're interested in is this goal, but if, you can, if we continue down our path of light pollution of the night sky, what we're actually doing is moving backwards into the beginning. So photog photography has gone a long way. We don't want to have our physical, um, physical human resources backtrack on photography, right? So some more examples of night glares. So you can see the one on the left-hand side on the bottom, right? And that's caused by, at the grand scale of the macro level, you can see that lights are everywhere. But when you look at a street light, right, a photograph at night shouldn't have that glare. Even though you even have the red eye removal, right, that still is not going to help if we can continue having our lights set up the way we are in this current infrastructure. Now, um, I went back a little bit, but some of the problems that you can see here are glares, sky glow, okay? So the night sky brightens in certain area that have pop a huge population, right? And that's, you can see from the satellite uh, photographs, that looks very good, but at the same time, it's not very well received on Earth, right? And then light threads pass. So we know the idea of threads passing, right? Not in my backyard, 
Well, your light, your street light, should also not be in my backyard. Should not cause me to lose my night vision, right, of the beautiful sky. And then clutter, which is places where lights should be, you don't see, and then places where light shouldn't be, you, you happen to see them. So clutter means your vision, right, is concentrated in the light, the lit area, and then the night, the dark areas, you get distracted away when you, what you're supposed to see or focus on is the dark side, right? So here's an example. So you can see here, if you have just one light shining at night, right, out in your front porch, versus if you have three lights, no matter what light type it is, right, you can see that what your focus vision is is now changed, right? You don't know where to focus. Even though walking the street is very nice, right? But if you look up at night, imagine that, right? What you're gonna see is that. So you're gonna have a glare where you're supposed to be focused. And you, let's say you wanna see a star, right? The North Star behind that house. Well, guess what? It's now a glare. So that's how that, that's how light pollution affects us at the individual level. Um, now, I think I'm going to pause for a little discussion. I don't want you to read, because when you read, uh, you ruin the fun. So, these two cars. Is it possible for us to get the lights off a little bit, just for like a few seconds? I'm not going to cover. I'll trust you not to read. Okay. What colors are those cars? And are they the same or different colors? Black, black. black and? Same. same. Two cars, the same color? Okay. Thank you. Can, can we get the lights back? They both appear black. You can see the, the text now, right? Um, they are actually different shades. Okay, different shades, okay? This one is black. This one is bright red. And that's what the night sky is doing. Okay, or that's what the, the lights are doing to our night sky, right? We rely on the night sky to see certain features, but they are two cars, same cars, but two different colors. And practically two very different colors, right? Uh, red, as you know, is the color that you don't want to have if you're trying to evade police attention, right? Whereas the red, the black car is just one of those you don't want to have because it requires cleaning all the time, right? So no matter what, right, two very different colors serve very different functional purposes, parked next to each other, yet we see them both as black because of light pollution. Now, I have to interject a little bit with the physics behind this because, as you know, besides the fact that I'm an undergrad, my undergrad is in environmental science, I am now a physics teacher. So, uh, the electromagnetic spectrum, or what we know as Roy G. Biff, right? So, you can see here that there is a peak in the green and uh, green yellow area. So what you see there, the temperature, um, the temperature which is measured, right, for, color, for different colors, you can see here different colors, different light bulbs, right? So there is an intricate relationship between wavelength and light bulb. Um, no, wavelength and color, right? So the, the color that are more towards the darker side, right? You can see that there's a peak right around where the green is from the red, the yellow turning to the green, and that peak is reflected here, right? So what you're seeing here is temperature will decrease this way, right? As the wavelength, which is the color, uh, the reflection of the color spectrum on the wavelength, Temperature decrease as wavelength. Anyone physics here? So they have this 
in inverse relationship. Color decrease, uh, color will, uh, the color or the temperature will increase as the temperature is decreasing and vice versa. As temperature increases, color will decrease or temperature will decrease. So that's a reminder of the color spectrum, which is part of the electromagnetic spectrum there. Um, and what we're focusing on in the science of light pollution is this band. In fact, maybe not even as far as here, just up to here to here, okay? Great. So how do we make that, you know, how do, how do we make that, knowing what we know about the, the, the spectrum of colors, how do we make the light pollution a little easier? right? A little lighter on us. How make, actually, a little darker on us because we want to see the night sky. Well, um, here's an example, right, where they change certain light fixture. So there's a bit of the different light fi fixture, um, as you can see on the left, right? And you want to go for the light fixture that you can change and in households, for example, right? You'll hear more and more the change into LED. LED is not just because it's a better technology, it's a new technology. It's the idea of do, why do you develop LED? It's because you want to be able to sustain more of the lights around you rather than concentrate it on a single glaring spot. And that's what LED does. So when you change certain light fixtures around the household, you get this, right? The left-hand side is a garage, right? And you can see that glare right there, right? A car, um, one of those mechanic garage. And then the, me the mechanic garage over here, same mechanic garage, once they change the light fixture and the same night sky, you can now see, like, there is a darkness around, but you can see certain features better. You can focus your vision more. And that's how you would start. I want to also give you a little bit, before we end the presentation, a little bit of um, a few apps that we can use because these apps helps you eliminate the math and tell you um, if you can also you know, take a picture, they will be able to record and tell you what is the apparent magnitude of the light at night. And you want the apparent magnitude to reduce. And that's through fixture of light. So why do you change your light? Well, because you want to have less pollution on the night sky, but at the same time, how do you measure that pollution without doing this math? Here it is. So here's an app um, that you can use to measure. And you can check that out. I would definitely you know, recommend it. If you would like to talk more about that, I'm happy to have a follow-up conversation. Um, I would like to conclude the presentation with the app that maybe you can try. There's a whole community that you, you can post yourself on and you know, get with the social media uh, for a good cause. And um, I'll take any questions if there is. Does anyone have any questions? I think we're good. Yeah, thank no. Thank you very much, Mark. It was uh, very enlightening. And I hope that you all have a wonderful rest of your pie day and enjoy uh, the dinner portion of it now. And I want to also say thank you to Ms. Dr. Yu Chen.